Welcome everybody to our show reset. We have a very, very I'm very excited about our guest today. Me too. Right, Jackie, I'm welcome too. To How are you doing today? I'm good. I love I'm this good. blue one. Thank way. you. And it's a perfect color for our show. I know. I didn't realize it when I put it on today. Big blue, big blue yeah. in the house. Yeah. <laughs> so we have my good friend. I know. The goat. I don't know if you knew this. No, I didn't. They I did call, a lot of research. Too. They call him the goat, the greatest of all time. Oh, okay, yes. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> He was, he is, was, is, is the greatest receiver in Giants history. Holds, do you, you still hold all the records? Yeah, for now. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Amani Tuber, number 81. Let's give it a big hand. Right. Welcome to our show. Welcome to Reset, Amani. Welcome hey, to thanks Reset, for having me. Amani. <laughs> <laughs> that was so, so just to go over some of your records, 2007 Super Bowl champion, uh, over a thousand receiving yards between ninety uh, every year from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand three. Uh, let's see, you have the club records nine thousand four hundred ninety seven receiving yards. Is that accurate? Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking when he's reading this, you're probably like, "Wow!" I don't know, you know, like. Like, do you know all those numbers? You probably don't know all those numbers off my I don't. I, I don't, but I know there's a guy with some funny hair that's chasing me pretty about, uh, pretty quickly in Odell Beckham Jr. So I'm holding yes. on. Holding on. He's holding on. <laughs> 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 so, Monty, we go back since your second year in the league, right? Yeah, my second year in the league. I was actually uh, coming off an ACL injury. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that uh, I wanted to get some sort of exercise that would get my legs strong again and the deep stances and Kung Fu. And I wasn't a very focused player early on in my career. And a lot of the work, the breathing work, a lot of the uh, kind of the triggers that you, we, we sent to, to, to refocus, those were some of the things I used. And it really helped me on the field because – you know, when you get out there and you, know, you get people talking trash, you get, you know, you're getting <laughs> tired, you're getting upset. And to be able to refocus and concentrate on a very complex game of football, it really you know, frees your mind up for success. And that's awesome. And you heard about it through our good friend Howard Cross. Yes, yes. Has Howard been on your show? Not yet, but we're trying to get him. He'll be on soon, right? Yeah, we'll you got to get Big Howard on. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great to have you guys together. It'd been like the old days, right? I don't know, man. Howard's getting kind of big. I don't know if we could share the same camera spot. I think I'd be <laughs> to the side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> So, Monty, our show is all about resetting. And in your career, that's one of the things you just started sharing with us. It's really about a reset in your career, right? Mm -hmm. So you were, you were drafted, what, second round, right? I was the 34th pick overall. And wow. I came into the Giants, and I, I started uh, as a punt returner. I did really well. I had two punt return touchdowns my first year. I averaged, like, I think 16 yards of punt return for my first Nice. Time. I really wasn't able to get on the field as a player, though, um, as, as a receiver, because I just couldn't really focus in on the playbook. I couldn't really, uh, you know, the, all the adjustments that you have to have by, when you play, I couldn't really make those adjustments as quickly. You me on a dry erase board, and I could give you every, every adjustment that needed to take place in terms of blitzes, different coverages different signals that the quarterbacks give you. I could do all that. But then in the heat of the battle, I, I, the 40-second play clock is much shorter than the 25-second play clock in college football. So in college, you never really get tired because you get a lot of break in between the plays. Hmm. Sounds, sounds kind of counterintuitive because 25 seconds is obviously shorter than 40 seconds. 40 but seconds. in college, they, you know, they take a little time and they set the ball. Once they set the ball, then they start the clock. And the play and the pros, once the play stops, that 40 second clock starts going. So the plays happen much quicker succession than they do in college. And so your fitness has to be that much more. And when your fitness comes with um, um, focus, breathing techniques become important. These are things that don't really people don't really think about. But when you're a receiver out there running go routes, running deep routes, you know, and then uh, you can be running at and with the ball. With, full, with your wind fully around, you know, about you, 
then you get hit, you cool, your, your wind will totally leave you, and you wow. have to recover. So those are the things that, you know, the endurance of football and of the, the, of the sport that people don't really, or, uh, really realize, and that's kind of what I had to overcome. So and you had asthma problem. too, right? Yeah, I had exercise-induced asthma that I came down with in the NFL. I don't know if it was our fresh jersey air or what, but <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got it. And uh, I used to take the inhalers and all that. And with the breathing work, with the focus work that I did with, Carl, with Sifu, uh, Carl, I was able to get off of all of that. And I was able to be able to compete. Mostly, more, or not, more, more, more than anything else, I was able to think. And my mind was clear during the football games. And I don't know if it was, it was uh, physiological or just the mental work that I did uh, playing. With, with Kung Fu that really helped me. But all, all those together helped me, you know, have a very successful career in the NFL and play for a long time and was able to stick around long enough to win a Super Bowl championship. When you were doing martial arts, did that, because I, I, was, I was doing like a lot of research and I watched some of the videos with you guys <laughs> and you had said in one of the videos and you looked like you were like 12 years old, by the way. He still looks okay now. He's great. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was like, oh my goodness. And you were like, he reminds me of like my dad. You know, he's like a father figure to me. And I was thinking like, we can look 12 here. So, okay. I, I remember the first time I walked into the studio, I saw Carl there and Howard was talking to Carl. And I'm like, man, where is the instructor? Man? <laughs> This little kid here, but I mean, where's the instructor? So, it took I, he's like I said, you're like Doogie Howser. He was like this genius world champion by 22, and you're expecting like this, you know, like hundred year old man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you had said that when you were doing martial arts, you couldn't think of anything else. So, did that allow you to take that into football then? So then, when you were on the field or when you were in the room learning these plays, you were able to really focus and really take it in. Yeah. One thing you have to do is be about the moment and, mm -hmm. and capture the moment and be at where you be are where you at, where you're at at that particular time on the football field. And that's not thinking about what the media is going to say. That's not worrying about what the next play is going to do, what or, or how that play that you just had looked on film. You're just in the moment. I mean, we came up with a thing called a one-play season. So every time you complete a play, that was it. It was done. And moving and, and allowing your, and freeing up your mind to be able to focus on the to task at hand was something that a lot of players can't do. Because, you know, when you're playing in college, you're pretty much, you know, athletically at the top of the game. And once you move to that next level of the NFL, everybody's kind of at that game. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to compete at 10 tenths of your ability to when in college, you, you, could, you could get by at seven, eight, and you could still be better than everybody else. But when, every, when all else is equal athletically, you really have to dig down and find a way to compete. And a lot of players that are really talented don't end up tapping into that or go, are uncomfortable going to that area where they're all out. And, and consistently all out and it's something they've never had to do their entire career. And that's why you see a lot of players really talented in the NFL, just not be able to get to that next level because it's uncomfortable to mm -hmm. be that, uh, to ask that much of yourself. It's uncomfortable to, um, you know, focus entirely on something that you never really had to focus on before because something that usually is really comes really easy to you isn't easy anymore. It's work, it's hard, it's focus, it's the little, the little minute preparations that separate you from everywhere, everybody else. And uh, a lot of people don't want to go there. Well, that's one of the things you said in one of the interviews. You said that the mind does what the body tells it. Yes. And you've made a lot of those little sideline catches and try to keep your feet in. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal because you really have to focus in a tremendous amount. And it comes with uh, one of the things that we always talk about is repetition is the mother of skill. skill. And I, I came in the NFL. I never really toe dragged. I never really did any of that stuff. But we had a coach in uh, Jimmy Robinson who we practiced it every day. And I didn't really think about it, right? And, and it becomes like a reaction. Just like in Kung Fu, you don't really think about the moves you're doing. You should make them as a reaction. Somebody comes at you, you just react. You don't think. 
and uh, because the game is too quick to think. So like, I wasn't really particularly good at sideline catches for the majority of my career. But then towards the end, we got Eli, and uh, young <laughs> Eli was a little bit, let's just say, erratic with the football. And, and then, you know, now you kind of – you, 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 you're forced to do something that you don't really think about and you don't, you're not really comfortable doing, and it just became easy. Like, I don't really – I never thought about it. It was their reactions. Mm. And so you got to, you know, and that's preparation, years of preparation. I just didn't jump in the NFL or come out of the womb being able to do that. It took a lot of work, a lot, a lot of repetition over and over again until it becomes muscle memory. And that's the, the work that, that, for that little move, ended up you know, winning us some games, ended up moving the chains every once in a while, ended up giving our team an advantage. So there's all those little moves that you have stacked on top of each other, all those times stacked in together. And that's kind of what creates all these uh, special athletes. Like you see Steph Curry shooting all these three pointers and doing all these crazy drill and drill. He didn't just wake up one day and do that. And, and teamwork too. You had a great team. You had a great team, great team members. I mean, Strahan was on the yes. team, you know, Howard, I mean, Sam Garns, you guys had quite a squad back then. We had a quiet squad. And How we does had, playing with those guys of- impact you? Um, those guys, you know, it's, it's great playing on a team when you know that everybody is going to fight to the end. It's great being on a team when you go after practice and one of the best players on your team, the most decorated player on your team, is out there running an extra wind sprints because you're like, man, if, he's, if, if Strahan's doing what he's doing and he's running extra, maybe I should be doing it too. You know, and that mm-hmm. would just be, became the norm. Like, people would just do that to try and – you know, get a, steal a little extra practice time because maybe that way, maybe you don't have to use it all that one year. Maybe, you know, you never get pushed to the point where you need those extra wind sprints, but there's going to be that one time, mm-hmm. maybe this year, maybe next year, maybe three years down the road that you're going to need that little bit of extra juice. And you've been doing it for so long that you can, you can, you can call that, you can recall that really quickly. And that's one of the things that playing with a team like that, that doesn't give up with teammates that, you know, put in the extra effort, you, you're not the anomaly going out there doing extra work. Everybody else is doing it, and that's what makes a team. The culture of a team become a, turns an a, a average culture into a winning culture of a football right. team, of any team. And, and as an athlete, this, this little mental edge that we're talking about, just having that culture, that's one thing as an athlete. But for most of our audience, they may be athletes or maybe not, how do they bring that into their everyday life? Because we've talked about it. You know, you, you're at a place competitively as an athlete where every day you're fighting for your job. Mm-hmm. Every day you must be the best that you can be. Yeah. How can our audience learn from that and really benefit from that in their, in their own lives? Right, Jackie? Well, and I think that was what makes any kind of system run good. If you see the guy that owns the company or the woman that owns the company getting there before everyone else, leaving after everyone else, or just all your friends that you work with, go in that extra mile, you're going to be inspired to do that too. Because you don't want to be, yeah, you don't want to be a slacker. Yeah. No. (laughs) (laughs) At least I don't. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think that, um, you know, you have to be in a situation where everybody wants the same thing. And if you're a leader, the best way to lead is by example. Yeah. And by, you don't want you don't want to be the leader saying, yeah, you guys stay around and do an little extra work. I got you know, I got something I have to do. You want them to say, man, my boss is doing this work and working this hard and cares as much about this business. Man, if I, I mean, I'm not going to let him down. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's the kind of example that the players and the coaches that put in that extra time uh, they set towards their team because. One thing about it is nobody wants to sit there and, and see a guy working the least amount, getting the most amount of, yes. uh, of the credit for things. Mm. And, you know, you, you kind of have to earn it, not only with, uh, with yourself to kind of make you cherish the, uh, the experience of success, because there's a way you can be successful in the wrong way. And, yeah. and, and that doesn't do you any good because that's short term and that's going to hurt you because a lot of these guys that are really, really talented, that are just going to get by on their talent, usually don't make it in the NFL. You have to have this drive, this sort of, uh, I don't know if it's insecurity or fear or 
uh, some, a, a failure that pushes you and drives you. And um, if you don't have that, your success, uh, it's not going to be as sustainable. Like I've never seen a guy in the NFL who can just get by on, or in any business, that you can just get by on talent. Talent will give you, get enough. you in the door, but the work ethic is what sets you forward. And that's like, like my kids right now, they, they play sports and there's like all the kids around them are, you know, doing all kinds of extra work. And I'm like, you know what? There's nothing that a 12, like a five-year-old, seven-year-old, 10-year-old can do that's going to help them get to where they got to get athletically. What they have to do, what they're doing right now is setting themselves up and getting themselves uh, the love of the game. Because there's going to be a time where nobody's going to be watching them. Nobody's going to be asking them to do anything extra. And if they don't do it, they'll never get to that next level. And that's kind of how I, I approach things. And, you know, um, everything about success to me is, 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 uh, has everything to do with passion, love. And, you know, my, old, my litmus test is, would you do it if you weren't getting paid? And I absolutely, mm -hmm. that's great. absolutely, I'd be, do, I'd, do, I'd play football without getting paid. And they, I mean, I'm not turned back. I didn't give any of the checks back. <laughs> yeah. But they, they, I, I would have done it for free. I, I just love playing. I love being around the guys. And it was a lifelong dream that I was lucky, lucky, luckily enough to stick around for 13 years and do it. I have a question. I have okay, uh, but like, yeah, as yeah. a leader, just because we're talking about leadership should, right yeah. now. Um, which was amazing. I mean, I think that definitely inspired our audience. So thank you, Amani. Okay. Um, what, what about you, CP? Like, no, you have these clients, you have these professional athletes that you train even to this day. How do you know what each person needs as a leader that's going to take them to the next level in their sport or in their career? I just treat them as people. Yes. Because you have to look at the individual first and foremost. And I think that was the thing with our relationship is really just looking at Amani as an individual and saying, okay, what does he need? How are you going to you tap know, in? How are we going to tap in and help him to be the best that he can be? Mm -hmm. How can we remind him of times when he was successful and has been successful? Because, you, you know, to get to that level, you had to do a lot of work, mm -hmm. right? It just doesn't come easy. Of course. Right? Okay, course. so then once you get there, like he's talking about, how do you stay there? Yeah. And then just trying to find a way to make it fun for him and change your mindset yeah. too. Cause you learned a lot of different skills, the breathing, you were struggling with the asthma, which had to be kind of horrifying. I mean, to never have asthma and then all of a sudden you can't breathe. That's scary. Did yeah. Did you have an asthma attack on the field? Uh, I think I did, but I just thought I was just tired. You know, like I, I used to oh, run okay. in high school and we'd have these sprints and I, there were some times I was just on the ground and I was just breathing and I could, I took me like 20 minutes to kind of recover and get my breath, but I didn't think much of it because I never really had to, to go that deep because, yeah. you know, I was, you know, faster than people, but I, you know, we'd run sprints and I beat everybody, but you know, sometimes I really had to push mostly on the longer distance. Yeah. And, um, I just, it just never came up and, uh, because I was always in pretty good shape. So, um, yeah, I never, I never ran a mile though when I was younger. I never even decided because I knew I wasn't good at distance. I knew I was just a pure sprinter. So, yeah, it, it was tough. It was a tough deal. One of one of the things we've always talked about, and a lot of people who've watched some of the interviews that I've done with other athletes, is the transition. You know, the transition from being an athlete to, you know retiring and working or doing a different type of job or starting a company. And as we know, like many athletes, especially once they stop playing, they struggle. Can you talk about your transition from being a pro athlete to, to now a radio host, television host, right? Can you talk about the transition from, from playing to not playing? It's weird. It's like, it's, it's, Everything you think about when you play is like, oh, well, I'm going to make enough money and I'm not going to have to do anything when I get done, right? And that's kind of your solace. Like, when I get done, I'm not going to do anything. I was like, I'm going to get fat. I'm not <laughs> ever going to sweat again. Like, all these things are going through your mind. And I'm like, okay, so then I do retire and I do get fat. And I do, and I'm sitting there like, uh, this can't be right. I, I, I don't feel right. You know, I, so I started working out and I think that's what really, you know, I, I got my, my second degree in my black belt 
I, I ran the marathon. I started doing all these things and it kind of like started checking off boxes for me. And because when you are successful, like, you know, like some of the, sometimes the worst thing that can happen to somebody is you can get what you want. Mm-hmm. You know, like the worst, Ooh, like sometimes the worst good. thing that, like there's players on our team that work so hard and then all of a sudden they get their big contract. And that was like the crippling effect. And that was like, was the worst thing for, to happen to them. I remember there's guys that would, every time they had a break in the, in, during a practice, they'd be off doing their footwork and they'd be, you know, working on their hand-eye coordination, working on their pass sets. All of a sudden they get the, the big contract, all of that stops. And so what made them special and all the work that made them special it stops. So the, all that being said, I'm saying that because, you know, once you, be, you know, the old saying, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. That's yeah. what happened to me. Like I, I wanted to be financially in, independent. I wanted to be able to, you know, not work. I want to do all this stuff. And then I was there and that's the hard part because money and comfort does not give you purpose. And, <clears throat> and purpose is what life is driven by. What I think life is driven by. And so I started getting into the media, not because I, I really particularly love the media. I didn't have a, I wasn't a, a very much of a media guy when I was playing, but I just liked the challenge. You know, I was a quiet guy and for me to open up and talk and share some of my thoughts was something that intrigued me. So I got into the media. You know, I I mean, I I had some success. I had some failures, but it's like I said before, if you do something because you love it and don't care how much you get paid or don't care if, you know, that's, that to me was, was a purpose. I had to get up every day. I had to do this. I had to prepare. And it reminded me of like working, you know, and I think that, I enjoy working and that's what I, why I do what I do. And, you know, I enjoy accomplishing things. That's why I, I accomplished my second degree in my black belt. I've got into cycling now as well. I rode, rode a couple hundred mile bike races. I ran the New York city marathon. These are the things that I just, you know, keep you alive. And I realize how much I like athletics and how much training really means to me and, uh, and how much I enjoy it. So that's kind of one of the things that, that keeps me going, but the transition is hard because, Purpose. Purpose is something that no, nothing can, no money can, can solve you feeling like you're doing something important and you have a purpose in life. To where can our, for the, those of us in the audience that are watching and listening and they're thinking about, wow, I don't know how to find my purpose. What is advice, what is some advice you could give them on discovering their purpose? I, so what do you like to do? I mean, I, I, I liked to do Kung Fu. So I just started going, you know, I, I like to do yoga. So I just started going, you know, and whatever sticks, sticks with you. And, yeah. and sometimes like I'd be in the Kung Fu studio with studio. And sometimes I take classes with like little kids and I'm sitting there like, man, I'm <laughs> out there, man, I got little kids I'm working with. What's <laughs> going on here? But then it's like, forget all that. Do you enjoy it? You know, and strip it down, strip all this stuff down. You strip the ego down and all that stuff. And, you know, do what you enjoy. And that's kind of what kind of kept me going and kept me going to these classes. And I'm sitting there, you know, doing my black belt test. I'm fighting little kids. And I'm like, what am I doing? You know, but it's still, it's just <laughs> enjoy. Don't enjoy things. <laughs> How about, let's go to something bigger. Because you are actually so much more than sports and all this stuff. And this, this idea of purpose is so critical. And you and I get into some pretty heavy conversations just about all the things that are going on in today's world. Mm-hmm. How do you impart these lessons to your children that are really growing up in a different, I mean, things are really challenging right now for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. How do you impart well, these lessons to your children? Um, you know, I think it's, you can tell your kids what you want them to think uh, and you can tell them all you want, but unless you give them an example and have them, give them some concrete stuff that, you know, you live by. I think the best thing I can do is set an example for my kids. You know, I'm not the greatest at it, but I, I feel that, you know, I, I do my best. And, and that's really much all you can do. I, I try to tell them, um, you know, wrong. Um, there's a lot of questions that might now because, you know, the election, um, you know, uh, you just, those are the things that just, I, I, I'm trying to figure out as I 
go. But uh, the only thing I could do is be me. And hopefully that'll be a good enough example uh, for my kids. Well, one thing I talk about in the book, Reset, is how you can love a problem away. And I think you're teaching your kids to do that because you're saying everything you do with love, everything's about passion. What would I do it if I didn't get paid for it? And, I mean, obviously, like, writing a book, I mean, for a girl like me, I didn't get paid to write the book. I wrote it. And then you just hope to get paid, right? Yeah. And, like, but it was my passion because I knew it would help others. And that's the one thing about Reset. We want to teach people to love the problem away. You know, this. I like what you said earlier, too, about choose things that stick with you. But we must be careful not to choose bad things that stick with us. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? Because yeah. when I started yoga, and yoga changed my life. Mm-hmm. You know, like Kung Fu changed yours. And I was uh-huh. terrible. Oh, my gosh. I was so embarrassed. And, like, I started with these hot classes. Yeah. And I would just almost, like, pass out. And I'm like, I don't know if we're going to make it. I don't know if we're, you know, like, you're having all these, like, thoughts in your head. You're like, I think I might faint. And if anybody could have read my mind, and a couple yeah. times my instructor who's become my best friend, Jessica, she would open the door and wave it a little. <laughs> she'd be like, I think you need a little air. And you'd turn it a little blue. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh my God, am I that obvious? Yeah. But I love what you said about sticking to you because if you're not careful, we get the spiritual weight stuck to us and not the good things stuck to us. And it's the good things that help us continue to find our passion and our purpose. And it sounds like, and it obviously is what Kung Fu did to you. What really inspired you to get so involved in martial arts though? What was that? I know you guys said Howard Cross, Mm -hmm. but what was the thing? I mean, obviously you need to stick with something. What changed you to be like, this is what I need. This is that thing that's going to change my game. Well, it, I think it was twofold. Like, first of all, I went into the, the class the first day, and it was on our bi- it was a, our, our day off. And I'm going, going in there thinking, you know, we'll do a little something. And, oh, man, I, this guy's going to be impressed with how great I am as an athlete. <laughs> I put my hand, you, know, you, you do, like, um, like, these punching drills. And, like, halfway through, like, I'm, I, I worked out my entire life. You know, I, I, I pride myself on being strong. I couldn't hold my arm up. And, and, you know, after a while, I'm sitting there, my arm shaking. I'm like, whatever I was doing before is not getting me strong. This is like functional body strength that I need. And, and, and then I just remember thinking, I'm never going to come back again. I, the same thing. I'm never coming yeah. back again. <laughs> I'm going to faint. <laughs> sometimes, and sometimes you think that like, the stuff that you, that you hate the most ultimately is, it shows a weakness in you. And yes. that's what I took it. I was like, you know what? I, I didn't like it, but I, I was intrigued by it. The different set of, uh, you know, a different idea of working out to me worked. And it was, it was, it was, uh, it seemed more natural than lifting weights. Yeah. And I got a lot stronger doing it. My mind got a lot stronger doing it. And uh, it, it ended up really, really helping me and helping me, with everything, just kind of changed my whole outlook on life. And I think the breathing stuff was a game changer for me. And why don't you talk a little bit to our audience about the breathing? Because that fascinates me. Like we were doing this class the other day with Diane, who's on our read set. Yeah. And he taught her just how to breathe so differently. What did you teach Imani about breathing that helped him? And when I say change the game in your life, I mean, not only football, but I think it's your life. It carries you through everything you do now. That mindset that Sifu taught you. you Pretty know? much, you know, many people don't breathe. Or they're not yeah. conscious of their breathing, I should say, right? So it's really just retraining yourself to learn how to take a full breath. And so we made it a part of the training. And that's what we did. And it's a lot like the Qigong breathing that we did in our episodes. Mm-hmm. Well, and it, I think, too, that you get a little less anxiety, right? If you right. learn to breathe through mm-hmm. the moments in your life. Breathing impacts your emotions, your feelings, your mental focus, all of it. Definitely. So learning the proper way to breathe is going to slow things down for you. You'll be absent. Mental clarity. Yeah, which is so important. Now, when you did finally change your mindset, and I know Sifu is a huge part of that because you always say, like, you know, change your mind, you'll be able to see things more clearly. 
What did that do in your life also? I mean, obviously you shared that it affected your, your game much better and you became yeah. a totally different player. But what has it done yeah. in your life? Does it help with your children? Does it help with your relationships? You know, like family, whatever, friendships? I, it changed my life in the sense that, like, I went in there thinking that I was, you know, at the top of the food chain in terms of being an athlete. I was really closed-minded in the sense that, you know, I felt that the only reason why I wasn't successful playing uh, was because, because that was my life at the time. It was the only thing that I wasn't successful playing was something outside of me. And then I didn't have to look into myself to figure out why I wasn't where I was as a football player when I thought talent-wise I could get there. So then I opened my mind to like, maybe it isn't them. Maybe it's me. Maybe there's something in me that I need to get better. Maybe I need to improve. And then it's, it's like that in everything in life now. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when, you know, I, when I, uh, when I'm in my radio, when I, when I was trying to get on the, on, on a radio show, um, I wasn't getting there and I'm like, oh, they just don't like me. Then I'm thinking, no, no, in times of my life, maybe it's me, <laughs> you know, maybe it's me. And that's the hardest thing to do. And that's what I learned from Kung Fu to where I got to make sure my house is clean before I can point a finger and, and I'm prepared and ready before I can say anything about anybody else. And that's kind of how the whole Kung Fu experience has really been helping me throughout my life. And, the, and you know, by hanging out with him so much as I do, as you know, working together, he's a man of few words. He doesn't say much. So you're like, oh dear, I wonder what he's thinking. <laughs> I like what the way he's he asks you questions. That? I like the way he asks you questions, but by asking a question, He's really telling you what he thinks. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's like, do you really think? I'm like, oh, wait, wait a minute. You're not asking me that. You're trying. You're trying yeah. To think something different. Well, it's like he's tapping into our subconscious <laughs> to lead us to do yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I learned being a great coach. It's all about the questions, right? Yes. <laughs> Socrates. Yes. Amazing. So. Are you enjoying doing your radio show? I mean, you have, you're on NBC Sports Radio. Mm-hmm. It's the Omani Indian show. Yeah. Do you love it? Is it I do. Fun? I do. I, I love it because it's one of these shows where it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a debate show to where, you know, my, my co-host is a, a radio guy who grew up like a sports like junkie, you know, but I grew up playing sports. So yeah. us going at the same different perspectives. See problems, we see pre- pers- our perspective is totally different. Like he's all into this like, oh, well, this player is not going to, the fans aren't going to like him. And I'm like, players don't care if fans like you or not. Like they really <laughs> don't. Because <laughs> they know at the end of the day, if you have great stats, the fans will like you. Right. So that whole, the whole disconnect is what I think our show tries to get at like try to bridge the gap between the fans and the people on the field playing and that's why i enjoy it do you feel like it keeps you connected to the sports yeah it does but it it's not it's not really sports though because we're talking about stuff that's everyday life you know because if you take if you sports is one layer away from corporate america one layer away from uh, politics it, it, it's it's kind of like the politics in action you know what i mean or the the human nature in action it's like mm-hmm. a really like a guy's reality show so <laughs> yeah so, you know but, but there's actually a point that's a great way to put it <laughs> i was thinking like it's a man's own country <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly so that's kind of why i like it because there's a lot of human nature involved a lot of like uh core values being displayed over, you know, whether one guy deserves a chance or whether another guy, you know, is being a jerk to his other guy or is a coach being unfair to his players or a general manager shouldn't say that. That's all like human relations type stuff. And that's stuff that really intrigues me. Well, this week was a big week with basketball and a little, little bit of that controversy, right? Oh, yeah. With, so what was your perspective on that? Well, uh, well, Charles Oakley, 
uh, it was a former Nick who played for their team for 10 years, a very loved uh, Nick player. And, you know, he has been kind of ostracized by uh, Dolan, Jim Dolan, who is the owner of the Knicks, for a reason that we don't really know. We just hear different sides of the story. But um, I guess they had a 70th anniversary team, uh, or seventh anniversary kind of uh, thing of the Knicks where they bring back old players. And he hasn't been brought back. He hasn't been allowed into the Knicks arena for a long time. Oh, oh. So what happens is Charles Oakley bought his own ticket. <clears throat> bought his own ticket, he sat him down in his seats. And I, the, the, whether he was drunk or not, we don't know for sure. Um, but he, whether he was yelling at the owner, we don't know. But all we know is that there's a former Nick for, that got kicked out of the stadium force, forcefully and arrested afterwards. And after that, the New York Knicks said some unfavorable things about him, a lot of accusations about his drug use or anger management, all that stuff. I think Knicks fans are really upset with Dolan as, a, um, as an owner because the team hasn't been good since he took over, hasn't won many playoff series or anything. And, you know, Charles Oakley represented the glory days of the Knicks. Mm. So he gets kicked out of the, state, the arena and nobody's really happy. This is one me and my uh, co-hosts were both in agreement on this is it's a, not a good look for anybody. It's not a good look for, for the Knicks. It's not a good look for Oakley. It's not a good look for Do Dolan. No. And, um, or the sport. Yeah. Or the yeah. I mean, it, it just seems petty. You never want – player like fans favorites being treated that way in a public fashion being totally disrespected and um you know we were we were both came down the side of charles oakley although we know limited amount of facts but it just seems like a situation that should have and could have been avoided with a simple conversation and you, Do you know, think it can be corrected anything anything can be corrected but uh and it should be there, there there's no way that the owner of the knicks should be upset at one of his former players uh, who played for his team for 10 years and helped him grow his brand. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we don't know Jim Dolan's side of the story. He came on, he went on W, he went on uh, Yes Network a couple days ago and decided to further trash Charles Oakley, accusing oh, him of being an alcoholic, accusing him of all these other kind, of, needing anger management, all these other types of things where they're pretty much unsubstantiated and, um, Jim Dolan is not a, you know, yeah, he's a former alcoholic, uh, but he's not a uh, person who's qualified to make those types of uh, statements. So uh, I, 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 it's just, it's a bad situation that, you know, I'm, I kind of tend to fall on the side of, uh, of the player because management should know better on how to deal with people than, than let's <clears throat> say a former player. Well, and shouldn't management – put a good foot in the world and offer to help and just say, we're not sure what's going on with this player. If it is a drug or alcohol, but we support him and we will help him. And we would love to get him into a rehab or an anger management facility. Like that is the steps that people need to take is to help one another, not to just trash them. Cause that's doing nothing but that. It's going to just make him spiral out of more control if he does have a problem, which obviously no one knows. But you know what I mean? I know. It's like grow up. Yeah. You know, act, like, act like who you are and like do the right thing. Or act like you care about him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> act like you care about him. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to care about him, but act like you do. Yeah, you can act like thing. it. <laughs> Not just saying, yeah, he's banned from, this, from this, the arena for now. Wow. I mean, Wow. Well, the NFL has done a lot with players. Now they have player development mm -hmm. and people responsible trying to help other players, you know, get things together if they're struggling in their life. What do you think about player development? What is your I think the NFL and the Legends community have done a great job. I mean, they have a broadcast boot camp, which I went to, too. They've had a transition thing, which mm -hmm. I went to. They, they try, there's a lot of programs out there because there's a lot of people that want to help football players. But it's weird, like, once you get done, there's almost like a shame about it. It's like you feel ashamed that you are out of the league when inevitably everybody knows your time in the league is short. You know, no matter if you stay for 10 years, 20 years, whatever, it's still a short amount of time in your life. 
and you should probably you're pr there's more time in your life where you're going to be out of the NFL or any major sport than in it. And so you need to start thinking about things in that type, in that, in that way. Um, but I think the NFL has done a great job. And, you know, there's not many things that you can say that uh, commissioner Goodell has, you know, done a great job in, but I'd say in, in, in the way that he has dealt with uh, former players and whether it be by, I don't know if it's, because he wanted to or because public pressure made him to. But regardless of the fact, he's doing, I think, the NFL uh, legends community and the NFL is doing a good job in terms of – I think they're doing more than even the Players Association for former players, which, is, which, is, which says a lot about how lot. well the NFL is doing to try and keep their former players, you know, give them a second opportunity. There's, the, there's a school opportunity to go to business school. There's opportunities to do um, – franchise work there's opportunities to do behind the scenes media work there's a lot of stuff that they try to get you to do it's just our players um mentally in the right state uh, state once they get done playing football in terms of not not mentally like their brains or anything but like emotionally are they emotionally, ready to yeah. accept and move on to another stage of their of their life and and kind of let go of their their football kind of uh, persona that's one of the things we always talked about when you're playing was, you know, what's next? Yeah. And what do you do after the game? And I think that's a relevant conversation that, you know, more people, more active players should have, actually. Yeah. I think well, what even the, people. Yeah. yeah. I think what people, what, what, what athletes and people need to do is they need to kind of take the stigma off of being retired. Like, in, you know, re retirement, you know, for a football player, you're kind of forced into retirement, but. They, they kind of make it so that you – it's like a shameful thing, and it's really not. It should be like a celebration of the time you had, and you really should reflect back on all the good times you had because there's, you know, there's good times and there's bad times. I mean, Carl, Carl and I been, and Sifu and I have been through all of them. Yeah, <laughs> we've been through ups, yeah. we've been through downs, we've been through all kinds of stuff. But, you know, you, you got to – like Carl always says, you got to enjoy the process. You can't, re you can't go – you can't like – if you succeed or you don't succeed, that's not always up to you. But if you enjoy the process, you can never fail. That's right. You know what I mean? Like, you can never fail because you enjoyed your whole time of it. And it's a failure, but what have you gained from it? You know, you gain so much experience. You gain so much uh, um, knowledge. Knowledge and, 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 and learning how to work hard is something that isn't, doesn't come natural. I mean, you mm -hmm. really have to work at it. You know, you have to accept the long hours and, and the uncomfortable nature of it and the lack of sleep. You have to accept that. And knowing that you can accomplish something like that, to me, gives me solace. Like, wow, you know what? I put it all on the line. Whether I win or I lose, that doesn't matter. I did it. I, I put it all on the line. And uh, I think the real failure is when you don't put yourself on the line and you wonder, man, what if – I would have done just that little bit extra yeah. to get to where I want to be. Would I have gotten mm -hmm. there? You want to know for sure. You know what? I put it all on the line. I wasn't good enough. There's no, there's no, or, or I, it just didn't work out for me. That to me, there's no, there's no shame in that. The shame no. is the, the other part. Yeah. Well, cause then at least you have closure too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What is some tips you would give our audience? So if they're experiencing, experience a reset, you know, like nowadays we have, different careers you know mm -hmm. you were a football player and now you're a radio host tv host what would you inspire people to do to do these resets in their life and not be so afraid of them and putting it on the line so they can go and live their dreams of what they really want to do with themselves well i think you can't be afraid of being uncomfortable you know i think being uncomfortable is healthy i mean i one of the best times I've ever had, I was, you know, I went to a golf tournament. I didn't know anybody, but I was there and I was like, I better enjoy it and try to have the best time I could. <laughs> I ended up having the best time, but I was uncomfortable the entire time. Yeah. And I think um, it, it, I take that into other spark. Like I get uncomfortable in front of the camera. I was uncomfortable when I first got on the radio, but to turn – a uncomfortable situation into a situation where you master and you dominate that to me is, is 
you know, conquering your fears and bumping down off your list that you didn't, I didn't say many words to people, but now that I, you know, I've, I've worked on trying to open up um, and, and, and communicate some of my, my feelings and my thoughts, uh, I feel like there's something that I've accomplished just by me being able to do this. And, you know, your accomplishments are all relative. Just because somebody else gives you more kudos for something or doesn't, that doesn't take away your personal feeling about your accomplishments. And I think that's one thing that I've taken away. It's like, you know, like I won a Super Bowl, but, you know, I've had years where I was felt more accomplished as a player than the after the year I won a Super Bowl because, you know, it, I won the Super Bowl. We had a, we we beat a great team and all that stuff. But you know, there was other times where I was more proud of a team that I played on. And I was in Mac and O too. We got a lot of injuries, but we still went to the playoffs. I mean, we lost in the first round. But for just for us to get there, to me, was a bigger kind of accomplishment because all the st- the chips were against us. We didn't have a very good team. All our great players started getting injured, and we still found a way to make it work. That was a great accomplishment to me. I have a question about that because I was thinking about that. You know, you won a Super Bowl. Do you get more nervous or um, does your mindset have to change differently to play in a game like that? Or from everything Sifu taught you and what you said earlier, once that plays over, it's gone. Do you treat a Super Bowl moment different than a normal, you know, game? I think my, I played in two Super Bowls. The first Super Bowl, I was caught up in the Super Bowl moment. Like, I mean, I remember looking over and seeing the Backstreet Boys and you know, <laughs> sitting there looking in the crowd, and I'm like, wow, this is a big deal. <laughs> you know, they got people flying in from everywhere. We got the, uh, the stealth bombers flying over. I was like, wow, and didn't do me any good. Because at yeah. the end of the day, once the ball was kicked off, it was just a football game. Yeah. And we got our, we got this, that's one of the biggest regrets I ever played was playing in that game because we got beat so badly. It wasn't even fun. I like to, you know, I don't think our team was focused as we should have been on the task at hand and, Mm -hmm. you know, our game plan and our coaching and everything was just so erratic and scattered that it was easy for me to get ready for the second Super Bowl because I knew how bad it was to lose that Super Bowl. And that was the only thing I was focused on. I didn't care about all the other stuff. I didn't. Care. I didn't even. I don't even remember any of this. The week leading up to it, I just remember getting on that field and saying, "Look, we are not going to. I'm not going to lose another Super Bowl because I've lost one before." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got confetti going off. You got people crying like, "I can't believe we won!" And you got all this stuff going on, and they're ushering you off the field like, "Uh, yeah, this is for them. You, you need to go back to the locker room because <laughs> we have." We have a celebration for the winning team. Sorry, guys. And in New York, it's like either you win or you lose. You win. We had, we, we had our ring ceremonies where they gave us our Super Bowl rings at Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue, red carpet. They've got us wow. limos. Everything was great. We lose. We got our rings at uh, the, the AMC Theater <laughs> in New Jersey. And they practically threw our rings at us. Here, take the championship rings. So it's not like other cities where you can kind of like, oh, we'll give you a parade anyway in earnest. No, nah, not in New York. They don't care. You lose, you lose. And knowing that going into the second game, was, it, was, it was tough. Like it was, you knew that we are going up against the 18-0 Patriots. And if we lost, nobody would care. And so yeah. that's, that's – it was it – was, it was, uh, it was, it was a very uh, moment where you couldn't let anything, anything distract you because we were going up against one of the, the team with the best record of all times. So you didn't care about Backstreet Boys or helicopters <laughs> or cell things. You were like, I'm in the game, baby, and I am not getting distracted. <laughs> I do not care about anything. <laughs> well, Monty, I want to thank you. It's been great having you on. I thank appreciate you. all the information, everything you've shared with our audience. It's been really that's amazing amazing thank you so much and i I want to share with our audience too that amani because i was curious of your name and what it meant because i'm a little nerdy like that and so if anybody's curious 
Amani is Swahili for peace, and your middle name, Ascari, is Swahili for warrior, which makes total sense that you guys met and, <laughs> you know? And you yeah, became no. a warrior. You're a black belt. Yes, yes. Double yeah. black belt, right? Yes, yes. Second degree, yeah. wow. So, yeah, no, I'm well, glad to be on the show. I watch the show all the time. Get on Facebook and uh, thank really you. We'll try, thank to try to support you, you guys. You guys are doing great things. We appreciate Thank that. you. Thank you. We're Good really job. proud of Diane too. She's doing She's amazing. Doing yeah. Well, it was an honor to have you on. So thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back and join us again. Anytime. Anytime. Anything for Sifu. I'll do anything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you better say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you everybody for watching this episode of Reset. And we're glad to have Amani on the show again. Once again, thank you, Amani Tumor, for being on. Thank yes. you, Jackie. Thank you, Sifu, for having your friend on. This is an amazing and very inspiring interview. And don't forget, yeah. reset because you, you deserve, deserve it. it. Thank you.